My name is Francis Au. My presentation is entitled A Year of Unfortunate Events, How HKU Civil Engineering Delivered Teaching in 2019-20. to I'm going to cover the following, a bit about HKU Civil Engineering, Social Unrest and COVID-19 Pandemic, Teaching, Assessment and Challenges and Prospects. Compared with many universities in the UK, HKU is relatively young. However, we are actually the oldest university in Hong Kong. This picture shows the ceremony for laying the foundation of the main building in the year 1910. The main building in 1912, in 1946, after the Second World War, and today. The civil engineering program we offer cover the following fields of engineering, environmental, geotechnical, structural, construction management, and transportation. We now offer the BEng program in civil engineering. Actually, our undergraduate programs were accredited by ICE and ISTRA-E from 1950s to 1990s. Now the program is accredited by the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers, a signatory of the Washington Accord. We now offer five MSc programs in various fields, which are accredited by the Joint Board of Moderators of the UK. We also offer the MPhil and PhD programs in various fields. The university has a vice president overseeing teaching and learning. There are also many units that support the teachers and students. This VP was very busy last year, not only dealing with the contingency arrangement of teaching and learning, but also liaising with students, many of which were active protesters. The mission of the Center for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning is to enhance the quality of the student learning experience. This is more related to the softer side of pedagogy. A few years ago, HKU launched the Technology Enriched Learning Initiative, a team of e-learning technologists, instructional designers, multimedia professionals, etc., under the teaching and learning infrastructure to showcase, facilitate, and improve e-learning. This is the prime mover of e-learning at HKU. On the infrastructure side, we have the information technology services to support teaching, learning, research, and administration. HKU has created a resource hub to provide one-stop service to teachers working on e-learning. However, it was still difficult to get academics mainly focusing on research to buy in until the year 2019 when a series of unfortunate events occurred. The ongoing Hong Kong protests were triggered by the introduction of the Fugitive Offenders Amendment Bill by the Hong Kong government. It set off a chain of protests that began in March 2019, including a demonstration of hundreds of thousands in early June, followed by a gathering outside the Lechco complex to store the bill's second reading in mid-June, which escalated into violence. Protests continued and protesters planned a citywide strike starting from the 11th November. These disrupted transport in various districts of Hong Kong. You may have watched or read the news about the social unrest in Hong Kong. However, that may not have given you a complete or balanced picture. In November 2019, the protesters tried to block many major roads in Hong Kong, including the two roads providing access to HKU. The protesters dug up paving blocks and dismantled roadside railing for building up roadblocks to disrupt traffic along major routes. One day, we discovered that someone broke into our labs, presumably to get cement for building the roadblocks. A few days later, 
someone broke into our labs again. This time, they got our forklift, presumably to transport something. You can see our technical manager on the right following up. Sorry for the scribbling on the picture, which I received during the chaotic days. It shows the roadblock the protesters built at our east gate. You can see our colleague helping to clear the entrance. That was a noble act, as it was quite dangerous. Anyone attempting to clear the roadblock could be beaten up by brutal protesters. On the 14th November last year, the senior management team at HKU announced that in view of the uncertain and unsafe traffic conditions, classes on the main campus would be suspended for the rest of the semester and making teaching and learning accessible online. Therefore, it led to compulsory online teaching from this point. The second semester at HKU started on the 20th, January 2020. The virus was first confirmed to have spread to Hong Kong a few days later. Hong Kong was relatively unaffected by the first wave of outbreak, which observers considered remarkable. However, to safeguard the health and safety of staff and students, campus teaching at HKU was suspended from the second week till the end of the semester. In other words, we had to conduct online teaching again. Let us take a look at our four-year undergraduate curriculum as an example. In year one, students do engineering core courses such as fundamental mechanics, computer programming, etc., and language and university common core courses. In years two and three, they do the introductory and advanced discipline core courses. In year four, they do discipline elective and elective courses as well as capstone experience and internship. In addition, there are various student enrichment programs, including experiential learning. Here are the typical teaching activities, lectures, tutorials, experiments and fieldwork, individual and group projects, and experiential learning. The traditional face-to-face -face teaching normally involves the preparation of teaching materials, the delivery in the classroom, and follow-up assignments. Online teaching may be asynchronous or synchronous. At HKU, PowerPoint screen recording, or Panopto, is often used for asynchronous online teaching. Zoom is often used for synchronous online teaching. If a lecture is delivered live, should it be recorded and made available to students afterwards, this is often controversial. If this is made available afterwards, some students may tend to procrastinate. This is especially the case for part-time MSc students. Some teachers decline to record the live lecture and make it available later. This is another source of friction between the teachers and students. When we were forced to adopt online teaching in November 2019 due to social unrest, most of the teachers were relatively unprepared. The arrangement was rather chaotic. Most teachers then adopted the asynchronous mode. Recorded lecture videos were delivered to students according to the schedule. Students could raise questions at the discussion forum in Moodle. Teachers then arrange online interactive sessions in Zoom. From early 2020, when the pandemic broke out, we were again forced to adopt online teaching. More teachers then adopted the synchronous mode by Zoom so as to encourage interaction with the students. The practice of online teaching has improved further from September 2020. Miscellaneous teaching activities. At the height of the pandemic, we were even forced to offer lab classes online, which was definitely undesirable. We provided the videos of experiment and raw data to the students for preparation of reports. 
they were subsequently allowed to do extra hands-on sessions, but it was voluntary. As the students were then more familiar with online meetings, they were able to work on their group design projects through an online platform. Then they gave oral presentations by video files and submitted their reports online. Final year projects of research nature were handled similarly. However, lab-based projects had to be adjusted in scope. Unfortunately, experiential learning projects were somehow disrupted, involving cancellation of trips and rescheduling of activities. Project Minda is our flagship experiential learning initiative. Our students have been involved in the development of a few schools in the remote areas of China, as well as other Asian countries. Here is a recent project in Myanmar, which is related to the improvement of water supply system in a remote township of Myanmar. Following a trip in 2019, our students managed to complete the feasibility study largely online during the pandemic. We have almost secured donation for its implementation. Online assessment. For all courses taught online, there were no proctored in-hall examinations in 2019 to 20. There were a few options to replace the in-hall exam. Proctored OLEX online exam with Zoom. Essentially, students work on their exams at home under the supervision of an invigilator through Zoom. As one invigilator can only supervise online up to 10 students practically, a lot of invigilators are needed. Extended assignment. In view of the difficulty in proctoring, an exam can be replaced by a longer version of assignment covering the same scope. Students are given more time to complete the extended assignment. Final essay and oral exam are also possible, but they are not considered suitable for the courses in civil engineering. In December 2019, most courses adopted the option of extended assignment for the final assessment. At that time, the OLEX exam system was not yet fully functional. In May 2020, the OLEX exam system was ready, hence more courses adopted the option of proctored OLEX exam. In view of the disruption by the social unrest and pandemic, many students were apprehensive. Therefore, free assessment choices were offered to all students. Continue with letter grading and they will contribute to the GPA. Change to pass-fail grading and they will not contribute to the GPA. Or opt out of the course entirely through a late drop option. Challenges and prospects. Many teachers, especially part-time teachers, are not familiar with producing lecture videos. A few part-time teachers even refused to teach, and we had to look for alternative arrangements. The online learning platforms are always overloaded at certain critical periods. Students tend to be less engaged after this sudden change of learning mode. It is more challenging for lab sessions capstone design project, final year projects involving lab work, field work, intensive computation using software on campus, etc. A number of cheating cases were discovered. It is almost impossible to totally eliminate any chance of cheating. However, it is possible to make cheating more difficult, for example, by adoption of many different sets of parameters in the exam questions. Proctored OLEX online exam with Zoom is quite labor intensive. However, every cloud has a silver lining. The unexpected switch to e-learning within a short period is itself an achievement. The experience in e-learning will allow a variety of pedagogies to be adopted in future, such as blended learning. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francis. Um, I mean, one question that has come through is with um, what to do with having your, your lecturers not being very familiar with producing videos. Um, I, I 
And I know for me, it's one thing as well. I'm very um, presenting myself is always an issue. Certainly, presenting to a blank screen is an issue. So, could you expand more on how um, they got more familiar with producing the videos? Um, well, actually, it's it was. Actually, it was very difficult because uh, last November, all of a sudden, we were asked to do teaching online. And um, we actually didn't have all the hardware with us. Uh, well, not even, uh, well, the software. Uh, well, we, we did have some um, equipment, uh, but then uh, actually when all the teachers are going for online teaching, then, uh, well, we don't have sufficient equipment. Yeah. I've put a timer on. I've been told I've got 15 minutes. I've got a lot of slides, but don't panic because I've done this presentation in five minutes. So I'm actually going to go a little bit slower than normal. Um, so I wanted to do two things. I wanted to look backwards at something that I did last year called The Office. And then I wanted to look forwards to this year and give some advice or some thoughts maybe or um, and reflections on The Office and how we might use that thinking about what we do for our coming year. So, um, First of all, I thought I'd introduce myself. Uh, I've been designing buildings for about 12 years before I became a full-time academic. Um, and uh, I worked on a number of different projects. So I worked on the facade of the Tate Modern Extension. I, uh, <clears throat> I worked on the roof of the Ferrari Experience. Um, I uh, worked on, uh, well, I led the team on the Oxford Brooks project. So I had about 15 different people working for me, with me. Uh, across multiple disciplines, facade, civil, structural. Um, and I uh, was also involved in this project, which is actually the uh, the sixth form centre where um, my kids go to school, which is really nice. So um, this was a real pleasure to work on. So I, I kind of only did the early des design on this up to about stage two, but it's a, a lovely little timber frame building. And uh, I did, again, some early early conceptual design uh, on this building, another timber frame building. And, and the reason the timber bit is important is because uh, it will become obvious uh, in a while. I did a tiny bit of calculation on, on this project, working for Integral Engineering Design. Previously, I was working for Rambo. Uh, and then this, this project, Springfield Community Hub, uh, was about one third uh, refurb of existing, no, two thirds refurb of existing, one third uh, new build. And it was a large CLT frame building, which you can see there and whilst i was doing all of that work i obviously worked in practice and this is what it looked like in the place that i worked and and that's important so as i mentioned five years ago i left engineering and i became a teacher uh and i i, I am predominantly a teacher rather than a, an academic i do do a little bit of research i um just just finished supervising my first phd student and i've got another one who started about a year ago um and the reason I became a teacher is because I wanted to have a bigger positive impact in terms of um, the climate emergency. I was really interested in a lot of what was being discussed yesterday. And I've been talking a lot to some of the people who were involved in yesterday. Me and Ollie uh, wrote an article together on the curriculum and the climate emergency, which Ollie discussed yesterday. And so I, I kind of wanted to have an impact as a, as a teacher. And uh, for about five, well, Probably for about five years, I've been teaching timber engineering at this point. Now, that's confusing because I said I've only been an academic for five years. But before that, I was actually doing a day a week as an academic or a teacher and four days a week working in industry. And I picked up a timber unit when I was doing a, my day a week. And about two years ago, I started to think about um, how I might change my timber engineering unit. Um, I wanted to help students learn more about timber uh, so that they could design buildings out in, in industry, obviously. Uh, but I also wanted to think about space. And, and at the time, I was very concerned with physical space and how we use physical space to enable people to learn. So I thought I'd ask myself a, a simple rhetorical question. Where do we learn? Uh, when learning to drive, where do we learn? And uh, when learning uh, to swim, where do we learn? And when learning to be a dentist, where do we learn? And when learning to be an engineer, that's now uh, I, I put this slide in really in jest. Well, obviously, this isn't going to be the case this coming year, but it's historically partly the case. But it is only partly the case. Um, 
So it's not quite fair to say the engineers just learn in lecture theatres. Uh, we create all sorts of learning environments. Um, in the lab, so here we're making some concrete. Uh, out on site, uh, this is some students visiting uh, actually the extension to our own building. Uh, in design studios, I love getting students together in design studios and I'm still hoping, very hopeful, but, but maybe too optimistic that we'll have some design studios this year where I can walk around and help students with their design. Out in the field, uh, surveying is obviously a part, an important part of our course. Um, in fact, the one place we don't seem to replicate as a learning environment is, is kind of the, the workplace, the office. And so last year for my master's level timber engineering unit, students came and worked for my company. Uh, I literally invented my own pretend company. Uh, we had our own logo and our own brand. Here you can see uh, I called them Just Timber. And one of my students took great pleasure in uh, adding uh, a little, uh, a little, their own little edition, which I highly appreciated. Uh, that was actually a sticker. So I used to sticker all the magazines in the same way as when I worked in industry. Uh, people would um, put a sticker on a magazine and then you'd be encouraged to pass it around and sign it off when you'd had a look at it. Um, we had our own calculation pad and mug. So I created this kind of sense of, of uh, cohortness, identity through, through doing this. Uh, we created our own office space. So this is the students working. The one thing we were obviously missing is a whole bank of computers for everyone to be sat at. Uh, but I got pretty much everything else in there. Um, it took about an hour to set up. I'm wondering if this video is going to play. No, it's not. So this is this is what the space would look like normally. And then uh, every week I'd come in very, very early, move everything around, put pictures up on the wall. I would carry pot plants through the building, which I relocated from the general stairwells into this space with the with the blessing of of our admin team, but I still got some pretty strange looks carrying these pot plants around. Uh, I created a little coffee zone. You might be able to see that. Yep, so we created our own little coffee space. We have lots of nice books, magazines, really keen in encouraging students to look at things like Detail Magazine. I love Detail Magazine. It's a really great way to get students to think about, literally, it, it does what it says on the tin. They have to think about detail. I created my own work entrance with its own sign to welcome you into the build, uh, into the office. We had our own tea point, which was fun, although uh, we had we had some challenges around keeping it clean and tidy. Although when they made it really messy, I, I gave them a little bit of a stern talking to, and then no one used it the following week, which wasn't the idea either. Um, and one of the working days happened to be my birthday, so I brought in cake for everybody, which I think is only right and fitting. Uh, employees came and worked for a day a week for 10 weeks. Um, at the end of the session, employees were encouraged to pack away all of their resources and go home. So that was that. There were no lectures. I didn't stand up and, and deliver a lecture. Um, if you knew me, you would know how difficult that was. I love lecturing. I, I really enjoy it. So it was quite tough to actually not give any lectures. Um, but there was a whole load of pre-reading. And so I've actually kind of to enable this project, I, I ended up having to write a couple of books. Um, one is a conceptual design of buildings, uh, which is out with the, uh, by the iStruct um, and covers not just timber design, but steel and concrete as well. And takes you through from kind of stage zero, stage one, right to the end of stage two in terms of the conceptual design process. So I shared that with my students when it was in its proof stage and its draft development stage to get them uh, a to, to um, helpfully learn from it but also I got a whole load of helpful feedback in terms of what made sense and where I've made errors. The second thing I wrote was this Designing Timber Structures which is a, a designed as a textbook for students so there's a whole load of brilliant books out there for people who um, know how to design out of timber but there isn't a whole load of great resource to enable students who've never done any design work or design work out of timber to get them started to understand about things like K-Mod, to understand about, um, yeah, all the different factors, creep, uh, long-term, short-term, load duration effects, all of that sort of stuff. So I decided to write a book with Trada to try and engage in a conversation around that. And I did create a whole load of notes as well. Ah, this one's playing, brilliant. I also created a whole load of 15-minute videos where I went through and I did a sample calculation. So it was a one-page calc where I talked through the whole process and they could see how, how you might do the calculation. 
And uh, I did some surveys at the end and it turned out that most students watch the video rather than read the notes, which is no, maybe no surprise. Um, and students worked on four authentic projects. Uh, so I think it's Lombardi who wrote the paper on authentic learning. Uh, I hadn't heard about this when I started up teaching, but it turns out that as an engineer who likes to teach about engineering and situate everything within the, like, the context of practice, everything that we do, and if you do that too, then probably everything you do ticks all the boxes for Lombardi's uh, definition of what it is to do authentic teaching and learning. So we had real briefs. I created a whole load of briefs. I tried to style them on the sort of briefs I might have had in industry. Uh, real, intentionally not very good drawings uh, of, from a variety of sources. This is one of my doodles that I did. Um, we had real context. So one of the projects I got them to do was a reuse of an existing building and they had to think about how to strengthen some existing joists. Uh, real clients. So the big project they worked on was actually designing a temporary theatre for the old Vic. And uh, Dave from the old Vic came and spoke to them and actually he did a great job of giving us a guided tour of their facilities as well. Uh, the first few projects were designed to teach employees or students all they need to know about timber. So they were formative. And then the fourth project was designed to assess them what they had learned. Um, now I've written a ridiculous amount about the office. Apologies, I basically, because it was part of a, a, a kind of a le le teaching fellowship, I blogged about it, so there's lots and lots. But if you go to episode zero, that will take you to everything else that I've highlighted. So uh, this is a book which I bought, and I, I quite like the title of it. Um, but also, uh, I wanted to give some honest advice for uh, people who are designing teaching. Um, so I, I think of myself as a teaching designer, uh, and maybe you do too, partly because I like to think of it, uh, teaching as, as an engineering problem. So the first thing I'd recommend is to think about uh, what are your strengths and weaknesses before? What were we good at before all of this happened? What was it that we were good at? Uh, because actually a lot of what we were good at hasn't changed. So uh, for me, the things that I was good at were things like I had industry experience so I could bring that experience to my students. Well, that remains very much the same. Uh, I'm quite enthusiastic. Uh, you may have noticed. Now, that, that, that can remain the same too. Um, I worked really hard to be very approachable to my students. Now, there are lots of barriers to approachability in this digital realm, but actually there are also some things where it's easier for students to now approach us. So things like some of the digital platforms enable chat, which is actually an easier format. So being approachable is different, but it isn't necessarily harder. Also, I just reflected, we're faced with a huge design challenge right now. Uh, we all are. We're all in this same sort of similar situation. But actually, huge design challenges are what engineers excel at, I think. And so that's what we're great at. And so I, I'm whilst I'm I'm losing sleep at night and there's lots to think about and all of that stuff. At the same time, I am also kind of engaged in, OK, this is actually a space that I'm not uncomfortable in. So I don't know if that resonates. The next thing is. Um, which ties in with being yourself is, uh, sorry, with knowing yourself is being yourself. What is it that um, that students want to do? I, I feel like our students want to connect with people, that they can watch uh, YouTube videos of people describing stuff. My, my kids have one which they were told to watch during lockdown, which they, they hated. They referred to him as the blue man, who is this kind of personality free person who would just speak very monotonously about science. And they were like, oh my goodness, it's awful. So you know, kind of, I would encourage you to be yourself. Um, I've put myself into all sorts of pictures. I've been onto site and I filmed myself on site. I've been into the woods to talk about trees and where they start from. I've been onto campus and I filmed myself on campus and talked about the context for the project that they're going to design. And I've put myself on purpose in the middle of each of those pictures so that they see a person, that the students don't just feel that all they're getting is a, a kind of a robot approaching them. But actually, they, they see a person behind who's delivering this stuff. Number three, good enough. I mean, I, I, the number of times me and my star colleagues have talked about, oh, if only the students would do a good enough job. You know, they're so obsessed with doing a perfect job and they miss sight of actually an engineer's role is to do a good enough job. And, and yet now we're in this boat of trying to redesign all our stuff and we're all trying to do a perfect job. And actually, uh, I did some training and there was a really nice point about the fact that we're neither in a state of panic 
but we're also not in a steady state. We haven't had five years to dev design and prepare for the situation. We're kind of somewhere between the two. And so we need to avoid just rehashing our old lecture recordings. I don't know if our students will love it. But we also need to avoid spending months filming and editing and animating and refilming and, and edit, you know, kind of, you can spend hours on a video. I, I tend to spend uh, as long as it takes to record it and no longer. I, I try and do one take and then move on because there's just not enough hours in the day otherwise to get everything done. Uh, number four. OK, this is a nice one. I was thinking as I was preparing for this presentation, I was like, do I even talk about the office? How useful is it? Does that have any relevance on what's going on right now? And, and the reason I originally thought I'd highlight it is because, as I said, there were no lectures. And so all of my teaching was effectively delivered in a flip style where students would watch videos, read stuff beforehand, which actually is the model we're all going to now. Uh, we call it asynchronous design. So I've been uploading uh, notes and videos and examples onto my uh, Blackboard site. And, and actually, uh, that was the reason I thought I'd talk about the office. But as I was going through the slides, I had this sudden eureka moment that actually, in terms of authentic learning, most structural engineers right now are working from home. Uh, they might be able to get out to site occasionally. They might be able to go into the design office for, for a meeting or to, to you know just see a different place occasionally. But actually, our students will be in a similar situation to structural engineers. And actually, it is authentic to be uh, in the new office, which happens to be the desk that you put up wherever you can manage to find it. That, that is an authentic learning environment, which I thought was an interesting observation and maybe something to share back to our students. Number five uh, is let's help each other. Um, use other people's books, resources, and add your spin or expertise. We, we're all desperately trying to create new content. and um, where we can, I think we should reach out, we should support each other. If anyone wants any help, I'm really happy to help. Uh, we actually created a whole load of introductory videos for our incoming first years because we recognize that they won't have done um, half the last bit of their A-levels. And because we wanted them to engage in it before they finally uh, signed up to the University of Bristol, we shared it publicly. Uh, I've put the link there. It's open to everyone. It's not aimed specifically at civil and structural. Um, but I've written a third of the content and you'll find that there's a lot of civil structural content there. Uh, I do drawing and design. Please feel free to use it. I've just created uh, six worked examples where I have about 15 minute long calculations if it, on how to do timber design. If anyone wants them, let me know. Send me an email and I will happily send them on to you. Let's work together in this time rather than um, all kind of bunker down and be, be on our own. I think that is really, really valuable. So um, let's work together. I mean, in my view, engineering is, is hugely important. It's got a massive part to play in the climate emergency, oh, which takes me on to my last slide. Uh, and actually, we all want to succeed. We want as much as possible as many good engineers to go out into the world right now. So that reminds me that let's not forget in the midst of everything that there are other challenges ahead. Please don't forget the climate emergency in your, uh, when you're rethinking your design of teaching. Please make sure it's still really relevant and, and in the middle of what you're teaching, it really is important. Um, this has come from Abbas Perez from the University of Bolton. Francis, um, how do you manage the online assessment? Do you give extra time for students for scanning and uploading the answers? And how long is allowed for this? For example, uh, for an exam of three hours? Now, uh, this is something um, which has caused some misunderstanding. Uh, well, because we were asked to uh, move everything to online uh, well within a very short time and even for the final assessment uh well i think well we are prepared to give some extra time to students but at the same time the university level also gives uh, some extra time so it ended up uh, in the uh, december examination uh, somehow students were given uh, extra time very generously. Uh, so the standard um, well, time for uploading uh, is uh, half an hour. So um, apparently half an hour is supposed to be uh, sufficient for uploading. But then uh, sometimes technical problems may arise. And uh, so, uh, so we end up uh, having uh, well, various excuses uh, uh, and requests from students. Uh, but I think on the whole, uh, it worked 
fairly well. Um, uh, well, knowing that actually we change almost everything to online within a very short period. Uh, Ian Stewart, uh, he says, in the office you had contact with the students and can view their progress. How will you be able to maintain that same oversight in the new office? Which is a great question. Uh, and it's one that I've spent a lot of time scratching my head over. And I, I, I don't think I will be able to set, have the same oversight. Um, but what I will be able to do is create a, a project which has got lots of formative um, points along the way. Um, and alongside that, I'm going to have hopefully some in-person teaching where I can gather uh, my students together in groups and um, help them with their work. Um, in terms of the formative points, uh there's going to be a number but the one i'm most looking forward to is where i get my students to attend a design team meeting uh which is something that i've been doing for a little while in different units where um we get students to come as if they are uh the lead the the, the lead designer and they have to present their design to a group of professionals and the students themselves have to create the agenda for the session they have to create a series of sections and plans and uh, they have to go through their design as if they were in a design team meeting. And what we do is we provide informal feedback. So it's not assessed. They don't get a mark for it. But what it does is it gives them some informal feedback, but also it gives them some real life experience of what it's like to be an engineer going into um, into a, into see a client and to discuss your ideas midway through a design stage and to get some feedback, which you can then implement. So that's what we're going to hopefully do. Okay, thanks, James. Um, we've got more statements rather than questions here. So, uh, for James, there's a lot of people coming in saying that they love your passion and enthusiasm and generosity to the students and uh, the wider industry, which I'll reflect as well. Um, <laughs> I have uh, another question for Francis, if you're still there, Francis. Um, having had almost a year of online teaching, what were the biggest lessons you learned and that others are now looking at uh, an extended period of online teaching can learn? Uh, and what can we take away from your experience? Um, all right. Now, um, yes, it's, it's true that uh, we have been uh, forced to adopt online teaching for almost one year uh, because of the uh, social unrest and then pandemic. Um, I think we can have better planning. And I think one important thing is in planning the online teaching, uh, we need to encourage more interaction with the students. Um, but then at the same time, um, well, like what is happening uh, well, this afternoon or, or tonight, uh, well, there may be a lot of technical problems. So sometimes technical problems can ruin a, a lot of things. Okay, while um, we try to uh, engage students in, let's say, online uh, polls or whatever, uh, which is good. Uh, but if anything goes wrong, then the, well, the whole uh, uh, well design may uh, may become uh, well very bad. All right. And uh, the other the other difficulty is uh, in the planning of the projects, especially the uh, experimental projects, field work, and so on. Um, well. We have been forced to uh, to do even the uh, experiments so-called online, with which we are very unwilling. Okay, but for the sake of safety and health, we have to do that. Um, so I I don't think we can uh, go on like this. Uh, well, uh, for longer time because that would affect the uh, teaching quality. Um, the intention of providing experiment is to let the students have the uh, feeling, the hands-on experience. And uh, for the experiments, I think we still can produce the video, but for field work like surveying, uh, well, so far we cannot come up with any sensible uh, alternative. Um, so we are waiting for um, a more favorable time uh, during which we can have uh, real field work. So uh, yes, there are a lot of lessons to learn. Uh, and I think, um, this pandemic probably is not going to uh, leave us uh, for good, and uh, we have to prepare for any uh, well comeback of the pandemic, and uh, we have to uh, well get things ready. So any time when we have to go online, we should be well prepared. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, thank you for that response. Um, James, um, I've got a question here from Ali Reza in um, Surrey um, University. What was the students' feedback on the office? Um, you know, how did they react to this and what did they feedback? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the feedback was very positive. Um, I, I think, though, there, were, there was kind of almost something else which I was keen to achieve, and I'm not sure I did. Uh, one was around actually the number of hours students spent working on, on the project um, uh, and on the unit itself. And uh, historically, you're, you're, you'll be shocked to know this, but, but m my students think I put far too much information into all of my units because I get very excited and I ram them full, full of content. And, uh, and they're, they're absolutely right. And, and one of the things I was hoping to achieve with the office was actually a sense of... Um, sort of some sort of containment of that, that they would actually only work within the sort of the set hours that I, I set up. Um, and actually their feedback was that they didn't do that, that they still carried on working far more hours on the unit than they did on other units, which, which I was a little bit disappointed about. I, I think the other thing I I'm, would like to do and I haven't done is that the feedback was very positive, although it was kind of no more positive than feedback on any of my other teaching. Um, but what I'd really like to know is, Having gone into work and spent six months working in industry, did they feel that the office actually helped them prepare for that 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 next stage of of their life? And and actually, something I didn't really say, but I think is really critical. One of the rationales for doing the office was I really wanted my students to be able to work in a, a uh, go into an, an an office and work there. And when they got thrown a curveball, you know, we'd like to design this building out of rammed earth or, you know, is it possible to design this as a timber concrete composite or whatever it might be? And they go, oh, my goodness, no one's ever taught me about this. Rather than have no skills for actually quickly learning how to use new technologies and new materials, they would go, oh, yeah, we've been here. We, you know, that was what we did in our fourth year unit that we basically just got a whole load of information thrown at us and some projects to work on. And we learned as we went because my experience as a practicing engineer is that is how you learn and what i'd love to know is whether that actually works out for them when they go into industry and whether that that experience does enable them to learn in that way when they're at, uh, actually practicing engineers great answer and uh, it's good that you got that sort of feedback now i suppose this is a question for both francis and james and um, this is from personal experience from some of the digital delivery that we do as a regional group here in the United Arab Emirates is that we do find that certain people are, let's say, um, shy when they're online. Um, and, and it's hard to get, because we're giving workshops uh, and we need feedback and certain people seem to be shy and stay in the background, so to speak. How do you both sort of bring that out in um, your students, participants? I'm happy to go first. Uh, I think it's a really valuable question, a really important question to kind of grapple with. But I do think what's happened is the landscape has changed. So there's always been students who are shy and, and not keen to come and interact and talk to you and ask questions for, for whatever reason. I just think maybe we're seeing that now it's slightly different students. So actually the, the digital platforms enable some students who would never ask a question during a, a teaching session uh, before when they had to put a hand up and ask a question in front of their, their, their colleagues. Suddenly they're, they're asking lots of questions because they can type it in and vice versa. So uh, in many ways, I don't think this is an old pro uh, a new problem. I think this is an old problem. It's just suddenly affecting different people. Um, and I, I, to me, the, the solution, and I know that this isn't all of the solution, is to make ourselves as approachable as possible. And I've been kind of part of what I've been doing for the last five years is to think about strategies to make myself as approachable as possible. And um, I, I think that is just as relevant, maybe more relevant in this new digital ex um, place that, than it is face to face. But but actually, there is a power dynamic. We are the lecturers. We are the, 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 the markers of their work. We are the holders of the knowledge. And, and actually, we have to understand that dynamic and, and work to overcome it in terms of enabling our students to come and talk to us. And, and I think being aware of it is really important. I hope that partly answers your question. Uh, yes, yes. Francis, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, well do my part. Um, 
Well, I think probably in comparison,、um, well, Asian students tend to be shy. I I, I believe, okay,、uh, whether、uh, we are having face to face、uh, lectures or online lectures, I think probably that is the same.、Um, I have encountered different scenarios.、Uh, I think in a, a small group meetings,、uh, well, talking about、uh, projects,、uh, well. Um, I I may、uh, request them to turn on their webcam. Okay, normally they 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 do, but in large classes, then、uh, well I I've heard of complaints from、uh, colleagues that uh, students uh, well very often、uh, well do not turn on their webcam, and then the giving lecture is just like talking to air. <laughs>、um, well, it it, it is not uh, uh, something good、um, because most colleagues、uh, are used to uh, well.、Um, Teaching in the classroom,、uh, well, teaching before,、uh, well, a large number of students,、uh, and then the now、uh, talking to a computer、uh, is、uh, quite different, and、uh, it may not be、uh, too good. So that's why、uh, many part-time teachers、uh, don't like at all online teaching. And and I have one、uh, former colleague、uh, now helping to teach、uh, part-time,、uh, even refused. To、uh, to to teach、uh, online because、uh, he actually enjoy teaching、uh, well in front of a group of students. If、uh, he is asked to、uh, to talk to a computer, he finds it uh, funny. Uh, but anyway, the、uh, well the shyness of、uh, students,、um, well whether online or face to face situation, that is the same problem. But、uh, I think if the teacher Can state that at the very beginning. I think、uh, we can change it.、Uh, that is not a big issue. I'm sure. I'm sure. So there were great responses.、So、thank you. I've got one last question before we move on to session two.、Uh, and again, this is、um, a quick one for Francis.、Um, sticky subject. Can you elaborate on exam cheating at all? Or so most online examinations. Are supposed to be the、uh, the traditional one. That is,、uh, it is not an open book exam. And、uh, so when we、uh, do the so-called、um, proctored、uh, OLEX online examination by Zoom,、uh, actually the、uh, the student、uh, sh should appear before the webcam, and、uh, the student should not use virtual background. Okay. In theory. Uh, it should be just like、uh, the case of the、uh, in-hall examination, but、uh, we have、uh, encountered a few cases in which, for some reason,、um, a few students,、uh, well, have turned off their webcam. Okay, but then whether that was due to technical problem or intentional, <laughs> it is hard to tell. So we have encountered a few of these, and I think one or two cases. Uh, somehow、um, we decided that、uh, that could be treated as cheating,、um, and I think in another case,、uh, perhaps another student was、uh, seen having a, a piece of paper somewhere、uh, in the video because that that is、uh, recorded as well. So、uh, so that was also、uh, regarded as cheating.、Uh, it is very difficult to totally eliminate that.